Hey everybody, this is chapter 3 of the History of the Left by Darrow Schechter. The chapter is titled, The Frankfurt School and Critical Theory. In an essay written in 1965 entitled, quote, Subject and Object, end quote, now published in key words, Theodore A. Adorn, excuse me, T. A. Adorno, 1903-69 to 69, succinctly expressed one of the central tenets of the Frankfurt School as follows. The, con the critique of knowledge is a critique of the society producing that knowledge and vice versa. I don't know if there's, I don't think that, these aren't his initials. It's, Thea, it's like Theodore Weissengard or something, Weissen something. Adorno, it's T.W. Adorno, not T.A. Adorno, but maybe I'm making some mistake. In terms of the critical theory developed by the various thinkers broadly associated with the Institute for Social Research founded in Frankfurt in June 1924, the critique of knowledge means above all a critique of instrumental reason and its seemingly inexorable spread to all areas of social life. As mentioned in the discussion of Lukács in Chapter 2, Max Weber's analysis of instrumental reason suggests that one of the objectively revolutionary aspects of modernity and industrialization is the real possibility of a human emancipation from economic scarcity as well as from mythology and irrational belief systems. Yet this revolutionary potential is accompanied by the simultaneous risk of the rise of an increasingly one-dimensional society governed by a form of narrowly strategic reason. Weber intuits that if triumphant, such reason would be unable to address questions of ethics or aesthetics and would be empowered at the same time to undermine the authority of the political decision-making bodies to regulate economic processes. This turnout this turns out to be a plausible claim when one considers the effects of globalization and the neoliberal push for worldwide deregulation. Despite his deep pessimism, however, Weber's ambivalence about the tendency of strategic reason to eclipse other possible modes of reason is tempered by his hope that charismatic leaders might infuse modern polities with ethical and political values not directly related to economic interests. But Weber, who died in 1920, was not able to foresee the collapse of the Weimar Republic, which existed from 1918 to 1933, or the rise of Hitler and fascism, nor could he have theorized the significance of World War II, Auschwitz, Hiroshima, and the rise of mass society in the years of post-war World War II economic growth. Marx was a what Marx was confident that just as bourgeois class society had replaced feudal caste society, a communist and classless society would succeed bourgeois society. But the theory of a historical progression from caste to class to classless society did not actually materialize in the West. Meanwhile, the restructured specter of caste, albeit in modern bureaucratic form, seemed to haunt the USSR and its satellites in the East, hence one of the Institute's first tasks was to investigate the causes of the endurance of support for capitalism and right-wing authoritarian populism among broad sectors of Western European and North American society, including the working class, and to analyze the appeal of Stalinist populism in Eastern Europe. There are also major concerns shared by many of Western Marxists, but if the latter are nonetheless generally confident about the long-term revolutionary capacities of the proletariat, the critical theorists considered in this chapter are far more cautious in this regard. In the post-World War II period, which they witnessed firsthand, the working classes, who in Marxist theory were supposed to be abolishing the institutions of bourgeois society, were actually becoming increasingly integrated within it. This marks the beginning of a fissure between a specifically Marxist understanding of the left centered on the workers' movement on the one hand and other currents of thought and action on the left in Europe on the other. 
Additional dimensions of this fissure will be analyzed throughout the rest of this book. For now, it is important to emphasize that the founding of the Institute and the development of what has subsequently come to be known as critical theory does not represent an unequivocal divergence between the fight for socialism and other approaches to extending the Enlightenment and completing the project of social and human emancipation initiated by French Revolution, the French Revolution. Instead, it registers a tension on the left between the different possible ways of imagining what Marx in his early writings refers to as human emancipation as opposed to political emancipation signified by the rights of franchise, expression, assembly, and representation. It has been seen thus far that the way one understands this issue depends to a considerable extent on the way one approaches the mediation between humanity and nature. While bearing in mind that humanity is part of nature but not reducible to nature. In different ways, most of the Frankfurt School theorists articulate the idea that the complexities implied by the relation between humanity and nature are actually much older than the bourgeois revolutions of the 18th and 19th centuries and the consolidation of modern capitalism during the Industrial Revolution. They tend to share the related view that the problems posed by instrumental versus other forms of reason are in all likelihood equally ancient. Insofar as they do, these thinkers are sensitive to Freud's notion that humanity's problematic coexistence with nature goes back at least as far as Oedipus and the Greeks. By extension, the issues involved in defining this relation do not stop with institutional questions about representative democracy and formal equality, especially if they these are defined narrowly. It is arguable that they go deeper to anthropological and existential questions concerning life-affirming eros, eros, the secrets of language, the meaning of art, the relation between philosophy and aesthetics, and the structure of knowledge. Here are the reasons for the possible points of rupture between the claims of critical theory and the strategies of the Marxist left alluded to above become clear. If one examines the earliest essays, articles, and books of the Frankfurt School in the 1920s and traces the development of critical theory through the 1930s and 1940s, Right up to the 1960s and on to Jürgen Habermas's work today, one detects a common thread. This is the attempt to grasp phenomena such as eros, creative work, language, art, and knowledge in ways that pose questions about the conditions of epistemological inquiry and the possibilities of emancipation. This is in fact the sense of Adorno's claim about knowledge and society stated at the outset of this chapter. In one of the key texts of critical theory, Negative Dialectics, published in 1966, Adorno makes a closely related point by arguing that utopia is best conceived of as a knowledge utopia, in which it is paradoxically possible to make use of concepts to attain access to the non-conceptual knowledge, such as the sensual knowledge of art and aesthetics, as well as other instances of non-conceptual knowledge. Hence, a considerable part of the Frankfurt School's project consists in a sustained argument for the existence of a plurality of modes of reason. Adorno's notion of aesthetic reason and Habermas's concept of communicative reason are prime examples. Albeit in radically different ways, their interventions aim to counter what one might call the rationalization of reason in modern capitalist societies, first diagnosed by Weber and Lukács. Weber and Lukács examine rationalization in terms of the reduction of reason to an instrument in the struggle for economic gain and the domination of nature. While Adorno broadens their analysis of this phenomenon by looking at what he calls the fetish character of music in industrial society and the concomitant regression in our ability to listen properly to music, Habermas addresses the evolution of the bourgeois public sphere from an arena of intellectual exchange of information and informed debate to an increasingly commercialized adjunct of the economy in the structural transformation of the public sphere Along, so, along with Legitimation Crisis, published in 1973, this work is probably his most important contribution to critical theory. Given this stress on the link between knowledge and freedom, one can regard critical theory as an attempt to rethink the Enlightenment project rather than a romantic or communitarian rejection of the aims of Enlightenment. The ideal of a rational society free of prejudiced obscurantism and the arbitrary exercise of power is not abandoned and given up for lost. Instead, it is reconceptualized in the light of some of the more brutal realities of 20th century history and the critique of instrumental reason in the writings of Weber and Lukács. <laughs>
Critical theory attempts to remain alive to the Hegelian analysis of society as a totality of intersecting mediations, though without accepting the implicit conservatism in the Hegelian theory of history, which resolves the dichotomies on Kantian thinking by championing the inexorable march of history towards absolute knowledge and absolute freedom. Hence, the goal is to retain the dialectical emphasis on the dynamic and contradictory movement of thought and reality while jettisoning the idea that the history of thought and reality is inherently rational and progressive. To members of the Institute, this position necessitates a pluridisciplinary approach to the study of history and society. The aim is to move from traditionalist theory, which in their view is narrowly empirical and positivist, to critical theory, which is interdisciplinary and emancipatory. Their epistemological political program is announced in Horkheimer's Traditional and Critical Theory and Habermas's Philosophy and Critical Theory. Both essays were originally published in the Journal for Social Research in 1937, together with Adorno's Against Epistemology, a Metacritique written in the same period and published in 1956, and Walter Benjamin's precocious essay, quote, On the Program of the Coming Philosophy, end quote, estimated to have been written around 1914, they constitute the foundations of the early Frankfurt School's twin critique of traditional epistemology and capitalist society. Towards a theory of reconciliation of humanity and nature in the light of the non-identity of thought and reality. The status of epistemological inquiry on the left has had a somewhat ambiguous status ever since Marx suggested in his early writings that philosophy must be made redundant by realizing philosophy's claims and practice is revolution. To some observers, this appeared to be an almost anti-philosophical attitude, implying that issues concerning revolutionary consciousness were subordinate to the laws of history and the practicalities of political organization. Yet Marx's 1844 manuscripts, as well as his critiques of reification, commodity fetishism, and the division of labor had an important impact on the development of critical theory. The Frankfurt School thinkers looked at in this chapter are also inspired by Lukács' argument in History and Class Consciousness about the limits of knowledge sounded out by Kant's distinction between direct or metaphysical knowledge of nature, which Kant holds to be impossible, and our experience of nature, which he insists is mediated by a priori categories of the understanding. Lukács, dem Lukács demonstrates that the epistemological limits implied by this distinction may well have more to do with entrenchment of the division of labor between mental and manual labor, something politically conditioned and historically contingent, than any, quote, natural or, or eternal limit to cognition. This insight has obvious importance for the project to transform wage labor into creative labor while transforming instrumental reason into aesthetic reason. That is, for in the Frankfurt School project of working toward a political utopia, which is at the same time also a knowledge utopia. In traditional and critical theory, Horkheimer draws attention to the fact that there is a significant imbalance at the center of the theory of knowledge and the critique of pure reason between the secondary role of the senses and the active role played by the twelve categories of the understanding, which for Kant are unity, plurality, totality, reason, negation, limitation, inherence, causality, reciprocity, possibility, existence, and necessity. While sensuality is reduced to the status of an intuitive faculty registering the presence of phenomenon in time and space, the work of cognition is accomplished in the main by the mental ordering of phenomenon performed by the categories. Sensible intuition seems to constitute the broad and rather vague given the immensity of the problems raised rather than solved by the intuition of time and space framework within which knowledge is intellectual and mental. 
intellectual and manual faculties in their turn are understood as largely mechanical processes in which phenomena are identified and appropriately categorized. The charge against Kant is that he more or less internalizes the division of labor in society and builds it into his theory of knowledge. According to this interpretation, it is no accident that he also champions the economic interests and political values of ascendant liberalism. Horkheimer, Marcuse, Adorno, and Benjamin claim in different ways that Marx's undeniable rigor in the first of his three critiques of reason is secured at the great price of relegating the role of sensuous cognition to that of a passive function. In their view, Marx and Nietzsche, who would ordinarily be juxtaposed by most scholars and activists as radically opposed thinkers, had effectively challenged the Kantian view of epistemology and, by extension, undermined the credibility of Kant's implicitly liberal understanding of enlightenment. The critical theorists deploy an array of arguments explaining why Marx's 1844 manuscripts demonstrate how humanity transforms the natural world through the combined forces of sensuous and intellectual work. In this process of intellectual as well as sensual transformation, humanity comes to know the products of production as well as the institutions that shape the production process. Moreover, in Hegelian Marxist terms shared by Lukács, critical theory affirms that humanity is itself transformed when it labors on nature, since every successive stage of the development of humanity's productive forces results in the creation of a new humanity with greater knowledge than its predecessor, and more sophisticated needs and greater creative potential than previous <coughs> generations. In this context, the Frankfurt School tends to regard the modern industrial organization of the labor process as a highly ambiguous phenomenon. Modern industry raises levels of productivity to the point of making the abolition of material necessity an objective possibility, but it also separates the mental and sensual aspects of production to such an extent that people are increasingly unable to discuss freedom, potential, and need in a critical way that challenges the fundamental assumptions of the industrial system, which makes the abolition of scarcity an objective possibility in the first place. Production becomes an end in itself, acquiring a mythological character that sharply undermines the cognitive content of labor. In some of the more somber writings of the Frankfurt School, one senses that while critical theory accepts the basic outlines of Marx's theory of capitalism, it also doubts that the working class, due to the working class's steady integration within the system, can offer any alternative to it. This diagnosis occasionally prompts thinkers like Marcuse and especially Adorno to come to their notoriously pessimistic analyses of one-dimensional man and the totally administered society. Ambivalence about modern industry and technology is one of the main points of difference between Lukács and the Frankfurt School theorists. For Lukács, the proletariat, democratically organized in the Communist Party, will eventually attain class consciousness of, the pro of its role as the subject-object of history and act on its capacity for collective self-government by revolutionizing society. For the critical theorist, it is irresponsible and implausible to have this sort of Hegelian faith in history and Marxist confidence about the inevitable arrival of revolutionary forms of consciousness. Following Marx, Lukács firm, firmly believes that the communist society to emerge from the dissolution of the existing capitalist society would have the capacity to establish a relation of the greatest possible transparency between the producers and the products of the labor process. Ownership and control of the means of production by the workers who directly use them would enable the working class to become active protagonists of history rather than the passive executors of the plans of private owners and investors. For the Frankfurt School, this kind of revolutionary transformation is not possible without reversing the sensual passivity that is registered at the theoretical level in Kant's philosophy and institutionalized at the practical level in the division of labor in capitalist society. Here as elsewhere, Kant, while erroneous, is instructive in that he er his errors shed light on how the supposedly permanent structure of knowledge and the historically specific exercise of power and exploitation are complicit with one another in ways that are neither accidental nor mechanically causal. <laughs>
His faulty account of epistemology has the sociological significance of illustrating how property relations and the class structure frame human understanding of subject-object dialectics and shape the relations between the citizen and the state in industrial society. This is just a side note for me. I would be pretty cautious of saying that Kant lived in a capitalist society, but uh, I don't know. Anyway. This is another instance where Adorno's statement at the beginning of this chapter can be regarded as emblematic for the project of critical theory in general. As in Hegel, the mediation of humanity and nature is achieved in the form of a dynamic social totality in which epistemology, law, politics, culture, and political economy are all related moments. Against more mechanical interpretations of Marxist historical materialism, it is a form of Hegelianism in which each mediating moment is articulated to the others as a constellation and decidedly not in mechanical or monocausal terms as an economic base giving rise to a legal, political, cultural superstructure. In contrast to Hegel, however, it is not a totality in which the process of canceling and preserving of contradictory forces suggested by the th term alphabung is accomplished by discarding what is marginal and supposedly peripheral and harmoniously reconciling humanity with nature in successively more perfect forms of knowledge and freedom. Hegel's place in critical theory is somewhat ambiguous since whilst his dialectical method is a salutary antidote to Kant, empiricism, and positivism, Hegel seems determined to see reason at work in historical instances where reason has clearly become a poly... Excuse me. He seems determined to see reason at work in historical instances where it has clearly become apologetic of domination. While this is not at all obvious with regard to the phenomenology of spirit, it can certainly be seen in the philosophy of right as the young Marx notes. The point is that reason becomes unreasonable and even barbarous when it is subjectively manipulated by philosophers and social scientists who are fearful of nature's spontaneity. That fear prompts them to extirpate all aesthetic, intuitive, and sensual dimensions from the knowledge process in the name of objectivity and methodological rigor. Hegel quite obviously knows this, but his version of idealism subsumes all aspects of reality that are not identical to thinking, such as nature and being, within the all-explanatory power of the concept. Critical theory attempts to move beyond Kant's separation of the sensual and intellectual moments of cognition in the critique of pure reason by criticizing Kant's transcendental idealism, and thus far it relies on Hegel. But it also distances itself from Hegel's historicist model of dialectical alphabung underpinned by notions of inexorable progress and the cunning of reason, which suggest that instances of barbarism in the present are necessary steps on the way to absolute knowledge and freedom. Hence the question arises, if Kant and Hegel furnished the methodological tools for social transformation but stopped just short of revolutionary practice, why can one not find the answers to the questions raised by critical theory in Marx and Western Marxism? Does not Marx make it clear that philosophers have interpreted the world which is indispensable but that the time has come to change the world through revolutionary action? Do not the thinkers of Western Marxism indicate how such transformation is possible? Marx is necessary but not sufficient because there is no automatic mechanism inscribed within the historical process to ensure that passive consciousness and instrumental reason will become active consciousness and substantive reason. And looking at the Russian experience, it is clearly problematic to entrust questions of epistemology and consciousness to any political party. Critical theory pursues a line of inquiry that borrows from Kant, Hegel, Marx, Nietzsche, Weber, and Freud, though without subscribing unreservedly to any of them. Lukács argues that history must be understood in terms of the development of thought from Kant to Hegel to Marx. Insofar, he advocates a view of linear progress which cannot push theory or practice beyond the authoritarian states administering the systems of power presiding over Eastern European state socialism and North American and Western European capitalism.
Marx seems to think that the class consciousness of the modern industrial proletariat is immediately forged by the direct experience of the contradiction between their productive capacities on the one hand and on the other the legal and political institutions that channel that creative power according to the systematic imperatives of profit and capital accumulation. In an attempt to update Marx in history and class consciousness, Lukács suggests that the direct experience of exploitation and political disenfranchisement need only be given organizational form in the party. For Adorno and other representatives of critical theory, however, the problems raised by the implications of Kant's philosophy are not quite so easily solved within a Marxist framework. While endorsing Lukács' analysis of reification and agreeing with his ideas on the cognitive content of aesthetics, Adorno is also convinced that the imperative of saving the sensual moment of cognition cannot be achieved by writing Kant off as a bourgeois thinker. In other words, one cannot simply force the sensual and intellectual moments of the knowledge process together in the name of positive dialectics and declare them to be thenceforth happily married in practice. This kind of coerced reconciliation between sensual and intellectual inquiry cannot be accomplished without manipulating reason any more than one can declare theory and practice to be successfully unified in the proletariat without applauding a dictatorial regime as a reign of freedom. The epistemological validity of sensual knowledge has to, has to be recuperated by way of a careful re-reading of Nietzsche, Freud, and other thinkers from non-Marxist intellectual traditions, but it must also be recuperated outside the confines of the academy and in the individual aesthetic experience of each thinking and acting person seen in this light the frankfurt program of interdisciplinarity requires departures from marx which nonetheless retain and elaborate the marxist critique of political economy without which any critical theory of society is inadequate the critique of political economy and alienated labor has to be broadened into a critique of industrial society and alienated experience both within and outside the labor process. This means that, however suggest suggestively powerful, Marx's notion of the primacy of economic factors in terms of explaining the mediation of humanity and nature must give way to a more supple and pluridirectional understanding of that process. Here the break with the materialist Hegelianism informing the Western Marxism of intellectual activists like Lukács and Gramsci becomes clear. Whilst Hegel regards the unity of subject-slash-object and nature-slash-humanity to be achieved in Geist, Lukács and Gramsci see this synthesis in the labor power of the proletariat and its organizational forms of action. This is how they interpret Marx's dictum that Hegel must be, quote, stood on his head, end quote, in order to extract the rational kernel of the dialectic from the idealist shell within which it is lodged, and thereby facilitate scientific epistemological inquiry as well as revolutionary political practice. Bearing in mind the real differences between its individual theorists, Western Marxism tends on the whole to rely on a notion of individual subjectivity as a direct reflection of social relations as well as an idea of collective subjectivity as mastery over nature and suppression of non-socialist humanity. By contrast, the more advanced theoretical expressions of critical theory in the work of Marcuse, Benjamin, and Adorno attempt to retain the dialectical method whilst jettisoning the models of consciousness and subjectivity that Kant, Hegel, and finally Marx bequeathed to thinkers like Lukács. Especially in Benjamin and Adorno, one sees an attempt to move beyond anything resembling a traditional notion of the epistemological subject in an effort to transcend the epistemological content of pragmatic concepts of understanding and knowledge. 
instead of regarding consciousness to be a reflection of social relations, which in turn can be distilled into class relations, or for that matter, broadened to include race, gender, or other social relations, Benjamin and Adorno seek to recover a natural, or what Adorno sometimes refers to as a, quote, somatic, end quote, moment in thought, which escapes the mechanisms of social integration anchored in daily language and institutions. What is meant by recovering in this context will be discussed in more detail below with regard to the search for a critical hermeneutical Benjamin and negative dialectical Adorno method. As, with, as will be shown in chapter 6, the attempt to transgress the limits of traditional subjectivity and conventional notions of what constitutes thinking suggests comparisons on the left between certain instances of Frankfurt School of thought on the one hand and Foucault's ideas on genealogy of power, Darida's theory of deconstruction as well as Deleuze and Guattari's concept of the anti-Oedipus on the other. It will be seen that in different ways all of these currents of thought attempt to ask questions about philosophy and politics raised by Marx and to an even greater extent by Nietzsche. Nietzsche's appeal to the Frankfurt School consists in his insistence in The Birth of Tragedy, published in 1872, and other writings that there is a sensual and intuitive Dionysian as well as a rational and intellectual Apollonian component to knowledge of which the Greeks were fully aware and which the modern industrial world has largely forgotten. Nietzsche anticipates, quote, a revolution of all values, end quote, which liberates creativity from utilitarian considerations of profit and transforms the static conception of human nature, defended by the bourgeoisie into a pluralist, spontaneous play of Apollonian and Dionysian life-affirming forces. While in The Destruction of Reason, Lukács dismisses Nietzsche as a champion of irrationalism, thinkers like Horkheimer and Adorno praise Nietzsche's insight into the truth and knowledge content of aesthetic experience. Moreover, it is clear to the founders of critical theory that by illustrating the weaknesses of Kantian epistemology, Marx and Nietzsche also manage effectively to criticize Kant's liberal views on negative freedom and the antagonistic premises informing the theoretical and institutional bases of the liberal democratic state. Following Marx and Lukács, Horkheimer notes that an economy based on the division of labor, private property, and commodity production does, not, does a great deal to sever the links between the transformation of nature and work and on the one hand, excuse me, on the one hand, and the possibility of cognition that is not shackled to the knowledge deforming pressure structuring the struggle for self preservation on the other, far from being a particular feature of modernity, this struggle between humanity and nature has been institutionalized throughout human history in the class struggle and different versions of the authoritarian state. Here Horkheimer does not depart substantially from the analyses of Marx and Lukács. But in traditional and critical theory, Horkheimer adds that Kant does not manage to prove that the mere fact that there is consciousness guarantees a successful mediation of humanity and nature through reason. Though Kant's methodology prompts Nietzsche and Foucault after him to raise questions about the social bases constituting what counts as deficient or even pathological consciousness. By extension, the mere existence of the modern industrial working class and its communist vanguard do not produce conditions sufficient to guarantee a real revolution in epistemology and politics. Horkheimer explicitly states that if the existence of a social class and that social class interest did happen to offer a sufficient condition of valid knowledge and political freedom, there would be little need for philosophy or for inquiry full stop. Had this been the case, one would have the epistemological luxury of truthful imminence, either in the institutions embodying Hegelian Geist or in the successful union of theory and practice ultimately, automatically, excuse me, automatically incarnated by the Marxist proletariat. However, the insufficiency of Geist or a single class to fulfill the conditions of non-instrumental knowledge and positive freedom beyond the negative liberty of liberal non-infringement does raise one of the key questions of critical social theory.
What kind of restructuring of the socioeconomic institutions guiding the labor process would be necessary in order to enable production to abolish scarcity for everybody whilst transforming work into a source of aesthetic pleasure to the greatest possible extent? With the possible exceptions of Franz Neumann and Otto Kirchheimer, Neumann living from 1900 to 1954, and Kirchheimer living, living from 1905 to 1965, this question is never fully answered with any clear implications for practical political transformation of any of the members, by any of the members of the Institute, but by asking extremely provocative questions about the feasibility of interdisciplinary methodology and the relation between epistemology and a possible utopian politics of the future, Frankfurt School ideas became a major source of inspiration for activists and radicals on the left throughout the 1960s and beyond. Although incapable of decisively moving political economy beyond the limits explored by Marx, the founders of critical theory embarked on a rigorous interdisciplinary program of research aimed at establishing a series of tentative philosophical and aesthetic answers broadly related to the question about the transformation of the labor process posed above. These answers are examined in the rest of this chapter. The idea that the mere existence of the proletariat does not guarantee the attainment of non-instrumental knowledge or the outbreak of revolutionary action is more than a small point of tension between critical theory and Western Marxism. It will be recalled from chapter 2 that in German, the German ideology, Marx and Engels claim that the ruling ideas are in every epoch ruling class ideas, and that Gramsci regards this power over ideas to be one of the key factors explaining how the hegemonic classes are able to establish the legitimacy of their ways of thinking and acting for society as a whole. Gramsci does not question the analysis provided by Marx and Engels as such, but wants the working class to become the ruling class so that working class ideas can become the ruling ideas. It is also clear to him that the strategy that worked for the Bolsheviks in Russia is not appropriate in Central and Western Europe, where intellectuals and institutions of civil society mediate between the economy and the more openly repressive organs of state violence, such that the class struggle in the economy is also a battle of ideas in civil society. In comparison with the Russian case, the army and police play a relatively minor role in the physiognomy of bourgeois hegemony in the West. Whilst the Bolsheviks did not need to worry too much about civil society and could make a direct assault on the Winter Palace in the St. Petersburg, Western Marxism needed to find an alternative, more consensual route to power. Hence, while Marx and the exponents of Western Marxism ask how working class ideas can become the hegemonic ideas, critical theorists such as Benjamin and Adorno ask a different set of questions. These include, in what kind of society would ideas cease to be defense mechanisms, against nature's lack of spontaneous generosity with its fruits, and in what kind of society would thought and language open up the secrets of objects instead of being tools for their manipulation. In their work, this leads to an implicit distinction between the real, the actual, which presents itself at face value as, quote, the way things are, end quote, and the true, the marginalized, which is often incompatible with the way things happen to be, and the related development of a methodology of critical hermeneutics and negative dialectics. Critical hermeneutics and negative dialectics are deployed against the traditional idealism of Kant and Hegel, Husserl's phenomenology and Heidegger's ontology. Adorno cites the philosophies of Bergson who lived from 1859 to 1941, and Husserl and Husserl's pup pupil, Heidegger, as the most important of the many failed attempts to reestablish the epistemological foundations of the bourgeois order in the face of the challenges posed by Marx and the gradual democratization of political representation. For Adorno, these projects are as flawed as the attempt in Western Marxism to assume the problems of individual epistemology, subjectivity, excuse me, epistemological subjectivity, are redundant in the supposedly post-bourgeois era of collective subjectivity announced in different ways by the philosophies of Lukács and Heidegger. For the authors of History and Class Consciousness and Being in Time, the proletariat and das Volk, the people, spontaneously overcome the liberal dichotomies 
separating subject theory and ethics from object, practice, and politics. In theory, the philosophical bases of the liberal democratic Rechstadt are transcended in a way that points to the possibility of more thoroughly legitimate political forms of authority than parliamentary democracy and its cumbersome system of petty deals and endless compromises. Proletarian action and the Dasein of national communities release, excuse me, realize a modern unity of theory and practice reminiscent of Aristotle's concept of phronesis, i.e. a kind of spontaneous knowledge which is simultaneously both theoretical and practical. Adorno does not directly pronounce the, on the problems raised by Aristotle's notion of the unity of theory and practice, nor does Adorno in any way intend to defend liberalism. For all of the problems in Kant and liberalism generally, however, Kant, uh, Adorno argues the supposed unity of subject-slash-theory and object-slash-practice in Lukács and Heidegger to be coerced and in significant ways as a step back to pre-Kantian and pre-Hegelian positions. One must bear in mind that the philosophies of Kant and Hegel are the most mature theoretical expressions of the philosophy of an ascendant social class which is demonstrably progressive vis-à-vis -vis its aristocratic predecessor. As such, their ideas bear a moment of objectivity in the Hegelian sense of objective spirit. They say something true about a world that is false, i.e. about a form of existence that is not yet liberated from domination and to that extent still falsely represented in a philosophy that is nonetheless as truthful as thought possibly can be at that particular historical juncture. However much they might disagree on other issues in an imaginary dialogue with one another, it is clear to Marx and Adorno that philosoph philosophical error in Kant and Hegel is not mystified. Error here indicates the direction in which theory and practice should move in order for philosophy to be eventually able to say something true about a world in which humanity and nature are reconciled in a harmonious totality, mediated by non-instrumental reason and knowledge, that is, where domination has been overcome in, genuinely, in a genuinely pluralistic excuse me, genuinely pluralist community of non-identical equals rather than a patently false in patently false forms of state-manipulated consensus and nationalist bigotry. Another way of saying this is that the idealism of Kant and Hegel expresses something real, not just ideological, about knowledge and politics, and it does so at a precise historical moment, when class relations and a given level of development of the productive forces makes determinate modes of consciousness and actual forms of freedom possible. It is Adorno's contention that, despite their repeated claims to the contrary, thinkers like Lukács and Heidegger remain trapped within idealism. But by this latter historical point, idealism sheds its progressive character because it has not managed to realize its claims about knowledge and freedom in practice. Philosophical idealism fails to redeem the promise implicit in its own errors and the Sunni by not following the path that would have possibly led to a reconciled world. Hence, its latter-day representatives have to deny they are idealist in order to represent themselves as the radical successors to idealist thought. Offering something bold and new and tend to end up working in the service of the interests of political power, desperately trying to hang on to something that in reality is ordered in the process of decomposition. In the case of Lukács and Heidegger, it is a mystified kind of idealism resolving the tension between subject and object in the spurious instances of alphabon, afforded by the rhetoric of positive dialectics and the history of being. At first glance, they seem to radicalize the positions of Hegelian Marxism, Lukács, and Husserl's phenomenology, Heidegger. But in both cases, however, differently, they offer an untruthful radicalism which unsurprisingly aligns itself with party dictatorships. In Kant, philosophical and historical development should be run from Kant and Hegel to Marx, and from there to libertarian communist revolution. In practice, this path of development has been blocked, but not cancelled and preserved in Hegel's sense by actual events. In the opening lines of negative dialectics, Adorno explains that philosophy which seems outdated remains alive because the historical moment of its realization has been missed. In this fundamental text of critical theory, Adorno develops a critique of Kant, Hegel, and Heidegger and systematizes some of Benjamin's more intuitive and cryptic ideas on law and history of the 1920s and 1930s.
The historical moment which has been missed cannot be reproduced because circumstances change, but the truth content of the last moment can be of the lost moment can be recovered and redeemed against the seemingly inexorable forward march of history and the apparent inaccessibility of the past. This is what is suggested by the terms, quote, negative dialectics and, quote, heretic, heretic, excuse me, critical hermeneutical inquiry, end quote. Hegel and Marx see truth and reason working dialectically in history and are implicitly prepared to accept feudal violence and capitalist exploitation as necessary stages in humanity's struggle to overcome alienation from nature and an emancipated society. By contrast, Benjamin and Adorno regard history as a catastrophic succession of blueprints designed to master nature, which boomerang in the guise of oppressive social and political institutions. This is the consequence of thinking as mastery. Thinking as mastery results in the eternal return of different forms of mythology, and mythology culminates in destruction as a prelude to the flourishing of new myths particularly in Benjamin's usage of the term a catastrophe as opposed to a systemic crisis is indicative of a condition that cannot be patched up with some good management and diligent engineering. If one wants to understand why the Enlightenment becomes another instance of mythology, one has to surpass mythological thinking, i.e. thinking in the service of domination. Part of what this entails is transcending the standpoint of the traditional epistemological subject, though not in the ways suggested by Lukács and Heidegger. In Benjamin's mature work, the task is to make the ruins of destruction visible before they actually become ruins, so that humanity can finally change the course of history instead of remaining within the spell of catastrophe by seeking to reverse or accelerate it. The possibility of dismantling rather than assuming control of the ruling dialectic of mastery, mythology, destruction, new mastery turns on the chance of recovering a buried truth out about so-called historical progress that is so true it can break the continuum of successive catastrophes. Critical hermeneutics and negative dialectics attempt simultaneously to work backwards in time, though not as a conservative attempt to salvage tradition and culture from the ravages of capitalism, and to work forwards in time, but not according to some specious and dangerous notion of progress. Critical hermeneutics and negative dialectics reject conservative and superficially radical conceptions of hermeneutics and historicism that do not go to the root of the problem, which remains the relation between epistemology and human emancipation. From mimetic and constellation thinking to the theories of structural transformation and communicative action. From the perspective of critical theory, the epistemological foundations of the bourgeois conceptions of state and society have been quaking ever since Hegel's destruction of Kant's first critique of reason. In the critique of purity, is and Kant is, seen, is keen to map out an experience-based theory of knowledge that is distinct from the dogmas of pure reason and other notions of unmediated essence. <laughs> In so doing, he argues that thinking and experience are not the same, since thinking can stray into pure reason and thereby transgress the limits of possible experience and the objective knowledge it yields. What is left of experience and objectivity once they have been, quote, purged, end quote, of sensual knowledge and imaginative thought, however, is, it is capable of rendering a rather ahistorical model of subjectivity and a model of cognition that seems to be significantly indebted to the methodology of the natural sciences. From this perspective, the road from Kantian reason to Weberian rationalization is relatively easy to retrace. Kant's victory over pure reason in metaphysics is obtained by limiting the claims of reason to the verification of a series of mechanical mental operations which seem to steer thinking away from freedom and autonomy in the direction of predictability and efficiency. More will be said about this below. For now, it might also be mentioned that on, Frankfurt school, on a Frankfurt School reading, Kant's political writings also seem to transform the limits of what we can know into the limits of what we are permitted to hope. The epistemological argument about the possible existence but ultimately unknowable noumenal world is translated into a series of arguments about the theoretical compatibility of individual happiness and legal universality in pure reason, but the actual impossibility of anything more substantive than negative freedom and punitive justice in practice. <laughs>
While in the phenomenology of spirit, Hegel demonstrates that the Kantian distinction between thinking and experience is not really tenable, Marx and later Georg Simmel show that, quote, normal, end quote, experience of everyday life in industrial capitalist regimes has become fragmented, reified, and traumatic. Marx concentrates on reification, alienation, and the division of labor. Zimmel's work both confirms and challenges Marx in fundamental ways. He agrees with Marx that labor power in the broadest sense of mental and manual creation mediates between humanity and nature, but he adds that once individual and collective creations assume social form and objects and institutions, they acquire a life of their own, a third term between humanity and nature belonging to neither, which cannot be simply reappropriated by humanity in the way suggested by Marx in the 1844 manuscripts. Hegel speaks of objective spirit as being constantly created and reappropriated and created anew. But Marx thinks the working class can collectively reappropriate its political essence from the liberal democratic state in the same stroke that it reappropriates its productive essence by assuming control of the economy it creates but does not yet run. Hence, revolution and reappropriation of alienated essence are twin concepts for Marx. Even if the working class were to constitute the overwhelming majority of the population, Zimmel regards reappropriation in this sense as impossible because of the irreducibility of the social form to the will of individual and collective social actors. Due to the division of labor and what Zimmel refers to as the growing gap between subjective and objective culture, social institutional form in modern society is particularly elastic and resistant to attempts at direct political control by individuals, classes, and groups. A crisis of epistemology resulting from the division of labor and the elasticity of institutional form is also a crisis of radical political agency. Agency is unproblematic in Marx's critique, his writings on Hegel and Feuerbach, i.e. where a revolution is conjured up as the simple reappropriation of the alienated essence of a unified collective subject. What remains of radical subjective agency once the reality of objective form is confirmed. For Simmel, agency remains possible as a reciprocal interaction between subjective actors and objective institutions, but it is a kind of agency that is always mediated by a social dimension of objective reality that is not the property of an individual or collective agent. Mediation of this kind drastically reduces what individuals can know about society and drastically limits the extent to which society can be changed by radical politics. As a result, individuals are increasingly thrown back on their own resources and inclined to formulate individualistic and arbitrary explanations of the structure of social action. The implications of the twin crises of epistemology and agency diagnosed in different ways by Marx and Zimmel are clear. One witnesses a decline in the depth of individual experience as well as increasing levels of social integration and conformity. Where knowledge of social structure and social action becomes obscured, people tend to look to their neighbors for orientation rather than relying on their own impulses and judgments. In terms of critical reconstruction of history, in terms of a critical reconstruction of history since the Industrial Revolution, the end of integral experience heralded by fragmentation and mass trauma is twofold. First, institutionalized forms of reason as are for the most part reduced to an instrumental dimension capable of addressing technical and administrative problems only. Whereas in theory reason elucidates the contours of political freedom and public conception of autonomy for an enlightenment thinker like Rousseau, in the course of industrialization reason and practice is increasingly embedded within the contractual negotiations regulating conflicting economic interests. According to this interpretation, the privatization of reason and the corresponding utilitarian exercise of autonomy contribute to a Weberian rationalization of politics and its assimilation to various modes of economic conduct. The consequence is that political action is measured in terms of means and ends subject to highly subjective criteria of efficiency rather than evaluated in terms of its quality subject to publicly debated criteria of judgment. Second, 
It is no longer possible to write symphonies and operas in the manner of Beethoven and Wagner, in which the totality and fullness of the, quote, ordered chaos, end quote, of life are captured in art. The corollary is that it is also not possible, except in reactionary terms, to deny the reality of fragmentation and abjure modern art in the name of realism as Lukács does. His particular theory of realism can be seen as symptomatic of trauma concerning what he perceives to be the destruction of reason, the real causes of which are not addressed in, if one resorts to flight and denial. The same holds for Heidegger's determination to reestablish the integrity of some source or origin which has been obscured by a supposed forgetting of being and its history. In short, Lukács's diatribe against modernism disregards his own analysis of the fragmentary effects of the division of labor and is ultimately futile. Heidegger's notion of ontological forgetting offers a very inadequate alternative to the Marxist theory of reification. Heidegger's notion of ontological forgetting offers a very inadequate alternative to the Marxist theory of reification. Theory that is critical in the sense of the Frankfurt School insists on facing the staggering challenges posed by the historical end of integral experience in the modern industrial world, as well as the reactionary implications of folkloristic projects such as, quote, excuse me, folkloristic projects for a, quote, homecoming, end quote, to some point of unmediated origin and pristine tradition. The end of the particularly rich forms of experience that inform the philosophy of Hegel, the music of Beethoven, the many-sided creativity of Goethe, the revolutionary imagination of Marx and Nietzsche, etc., does not signify the end of experience full stop or the permanent demise of creativity or radical change. Theory and practice can certainly be relaunched on new bases, but this entails confronting the conditions that contribute to A, the reification of thought, B, the rationalization of reason, and C, the increasing complexity of social form. It is simply inadequate to suggest that decisive agency by the party solves the problem or that individual and national, quote, authenticity, end quote, can catapult humanity beyond thinking institutionalized as mastery and domination. Critical theory rearticulated from a more contemporary perspective might add that it also means confronting the conditions that make thought reified and reason instrumental rather than appealing to already existing agents and spheres such as the, quote, multitude, end quote, communicative action, civil society, quote, the political, end quote, etc. <laughs> Somewhat surprisingly, giving the implicit disparaging tone of some of the preceding discussions about the problems with Kantian philosophy, Kant actually offers an apposite starting point for addressing the conditions of instrumentality and reification. In Kant's third critique, the Critique of Judgment, published in 1790, Kant intimates what, can, what one can say that a landscape, excuse me, intimates that one can say that a landscape is beautiful. But one can also say that a landscape painting is beautiful, and in so doing, humanity becomes aware that there is more to beauty and aesthetic experience than what is beautiful in nature, even though that, quote, more, end quote, resist easy conceptual or linguistic definition. This insight combines the idealist point of view that humanity is part of nature but not reducible to nature with the aesthetic notion that works of art always exceed what one can articulate about those works of art. Moreover, the individual steps involved in the creation of a work of art can be thought of in terms of intersections rather than monodirectional linearity. Hence, the artwork reveals something about subject and object relations and about temporality as well. In Counter-Revolution and Revolt, Marcuse points out that this symmetry of beauty in art and nature is not merely an analogy. It points to aesthetics as a form of non-instrumental cognition and the existence of possible bridges between conceptual and non-conceptual modes of knowing. This idea can be explained as follows. For Hegel and the conservative idealist philosopher Schelling, who lived from 1775 to 1854, nature and consciousness are ultimately one and the same. For Kant, in the critique of pure reason, nature represents the limit to what consciousness can know. The analysis in Kant's third critique suggests that there may be a way beyond a rigid dichotomization 
of subject slash object, past slash present, and humanity slash nature, which would point beyond traditional idealism without adopting the inadequate solutions to the problems of idealism suffered by thinkers like Husserl, Bergson, Lukács, and Heidegger. The subject can attempt to absorb object or external nature in the manner of Hegel and Schelling. The subject can also confront the external world as an intractable limit and even a hostile, excuse me, and a, the subject can also confront the external world as an intractable limit and a hostile alien force in the way instrumental reason faces nature. Indeed, traditional subjectivity tends to operate in either or both of these ways, but the critique of judgment implies that it might be possible to articulate the truthful moments of subjectivity to the truthful moments of objectivity. This happens when we formulate judgments that are neither arbitrarily subjective nor dogmatically objective, i.e. when we realize that the truth or falsity of our judgments about art are not true or false according to the usual dictates of logic, whereby definition what is true cannot also be false. Depending on the quality of the artistic form, as well as the social relations embedded in which the work of art is, there can be truth and falsity as well as falsity and truth and an implicit desire to make truth even more, quote, to me, even, quote, more true, end quote, that is in any given, that, that it is in any given present. I think it should be then, not that. Adorno maintains something somewhat similar when he writes that subject is never completely subject. Because of the Hegelian argument that all of subjectivity is mediated by social and historical objectivity, and object is never completely object, because of the Kantian argument that all objectivity is mediated by subjectivity, although Kant does not explicitly speak in such terms, Marcuse and Adorno read Kant in the light of their knowledge of Hegel and dialectics in order to formulate the idea that in great works of art one has a constellation of the subjective, objective, as well as temporal moments of reality. This signals a qualitatively different way of knowing than identity thinking posited, positing an alphabung of subject, thesis, and object, antithesis, and an authoritarian and falsely manufactured unity, synthesis as coerced reconciliation. It has been seen that, according to the Frankfurt School critique of Hegel and Lukács, falsely manufactured unity at the epistemological level enfolds in the institutions of a coercive totality based on fabricated unity and mass conformity at the level of society. There is thus a utopian dimension to this project of thinking which can avoid rigid dualisms as well as practical implications entailed in eschewing the coerced reconciliation of the individual terms of the dualism in question. If the truth truthful moments in the subject can be articulated to the truthful moments in the object, it may be possible to get beyond thinking as mastery and move on to the epistemological political breakthrough mentioned at the outset of this chapter. It may be objected that it is far from obvious how subjectivity and objectivity might be experienced in terms of a constellation of moments rather than as a predatory conquest by thinking of what is, of what is non-identical to thought. It might be asked if instrumental reason is generally a defensive construction of barriers against the unpredictability and spontaneity of nature, how does one break through to a non-instrumental dimension of thought which is nonetheless rigorous? Adorno and the mature Marcuse look to modernist aesthetics. Benjamin believes he may be on the right track by questioning the juxtaposition of past and present, the separation of means and ends, and a number of other dichotomies typical of reified thought. He interrogates the conditions necessary for a transition from dualisms which appear to be locked in a permanent opposition excuse me, that appear to be locked in permanent opposition to paradoxes that can be solved in a revolution. In the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction, published in 1935, Benjamin suggests that at the end of the particularly rich forms, 
In the work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, published in 1935, Benjamin suggests that the end of the particularly rich forms of experience that inform the works of Goethe, Marx, etc., actually signifies the possible advent of revolutionary radical political change. This is because in the age of mechanical reproduction, works of art do not need to be performed live or experienced as unique and original. The work loses what Benjamin refers to as its, quote, aura, end quote. This changes the mode of reception of art, the relation between the masses and the cultural elite, and in the process transforms the dialectic of tradition revolution. He suggests that once freed from the weight of tradition, the artificial foundations of preserving various social hierarchies can be undermined. Experience in the widest sense then come, becomes shock. But rather than being a shock that incapacitates people with passivity and trauma, as Zimmel and Freud at times seem to suggest in different ways, for Benjamin it is a shock accompanied by the realization that humanity has entered into a phase where hierarchy is no longer the necessary price of survival. When it becomes clear that past generations have borne the weight of hierarchy and depression to make a life without want a real material possibility, it dawns on everyone that this possibility is indeed an objective reality rather than an exercise in the wishful thinking normally accompanying the fetishized consumption of commodities in capitalist society. The extent to which regimes that perpetuate hierarchy and depression are no longer legitimate becomes glaringly obvious. This realization comes in a flash of collective insight that Benjamin calls a profane illumination. Profane illuminations often come when the continuum of past and present is broken in a, quote, now time, end quote, of intergener intergenerational transparency and solidarity in which the prevailing limits on thought and action are suspended. If one analyzes the themes in the critique of violence and the Paris Arcades project and the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction in conjunction with Benjamin's theses on the philosophy of history, it becomes apparent that he rejects what he considers historicist notions of linear truth in favor of a messianic vision of time in which moments of truth from the past, present, and future are distilled and intersect. In the past, artistic creation could reconcile humanity and nature and contribute to the preservation of forms of society in which culture, in the traditional sense, flourished. In advanced capitalism, by contrast, tradition is undermined. Instead of bemoaning this situation by, in the conservative manner of Lukács and Heidegger, however, Benjamin argues that works of art can lift the oppressed social classes of society out of their dreamlike slumber induced by the production and circulation of commodities. Benjamin is convinced that on waking, they will rise to the task of ending oppression and exploitation. The legal system masking hierarchy is then destroyed and replaced by justice, where justice for Benjamin is synonymous with truth. Benjamin's acute sensitivity to the political possibilities offered in periods of historical transition is a central theme in the work of a number of the other members of the Institute as well. In State Capitalism, Its Possibilities and Limitations, published in 1941, Friedrich Pollock who lived from 1894 to 1970, attempts to show that just as the negotiation and, and renegotiation of the relations between church and state is one of the defining characteristics of modernity, so too is the constant renegotiations... Excuse me. Just as the negotiation and renegotiation of the relations between church and state is one of the defining characteristics of modernity, so is the constant renegotiation between the forces of labor and the representatives of capital. Pollock intimates that it is the hallmark of this constant readjustment that forms a state very that forms of state vary over time in accordance with changes in the structure of the economy. In chapter 1, we saw that in the 18th Brumaire, Marx explains how the state can assume relative autonomy from the dominant classes in civil society if the dominant classes are locked in a struggle in which no single class is hegemonic enough to dictate the terms of political compromise. Pollock attempts to develop Marx's ideas further by outlining a theory capable of explaining how recurring crises and capital accumulation produce predictable political crises. These are typically crises concerned with coordinating the degree of planning capitalism needs in order to function without actually introducing so much planning. With the prerogatives of private property are fundamentally 
so much planning that the prerogatives of private property are fundamentally challenged. He formulates a theory of state capitalism which situates the phenomenon of state capitalism as the necessary successor stage to, quote, free market, excuse me, quote, free and, quote, market capitalism. Despite some of the ambiguities in terms of state capitalism, Friedrich Pollock thinks that it captures four essential aspects related to the transition from free market to late capitalism. One, the structural problems of market capitalism, coordinating supply and demand without planning, lay the basis for the move to state capitalism. Two, a certain stage in the evolution of capitalism, some state intervention becomes a systemic necessity. Three, capital accumulation and profit continue to be the driving forces of the economy. Four, state capitalism introduces planning, though without thereby becoming a system of production based on the satisfaction of human need and the desire for creative forms of work. In other words, state capitalism is not state socialism on the Soviet model and certainly not libertarian socialism as Marx had envisaged it in broad outline when discussing human as opposed to political emancipation. Pollock's ideas on the correlation between the determinate stages in the evolution of capital, excuse me, between determinate stages in the evolution of capitalism, with structural changes in forms of law and state, are developed with striking clarity by the legal theorists connected with the Institute, Otto Kirchheimer and Franz Neumann. In Changes in the Structure of Political Compromise, published in 1941, Kirchheimer shows that in the transition from free market to state capitalism, the executive of the capitalist state is restructured in order to enable it to perform key planning functions. This occurs because of a subjective factor concerning class consciousness and class culture, so analyzed by a number of Western Marxists on the one hand, and an objective factor concerning the systemic features of capitalist production at each stage of its unfolding journey towards permanent and irresolvable crisis, first analyzed in terms of systemic logic and structural tendencies by Marx on the other. While the subjective factor contributes to the stalemate of class horses alluded to above, the objective factor results in Keynesianism and a variety of other attempts to patch up capitalism without really going to the root of the problem. Socially and cooperatively produced wealth continues to be privately appropriated. As I say, the root of the problem and its solution is subjective and objective, i.e. dialectical, such that subjective revolutionary will and organization by itself would have as little chance of producing real social transformation as a supposedly materialist science of history without an active and conscious agent of change. While subjectivist intransigence might be, quote, successful, end quote, in military terms, reminiscent of the party-based movements of Lenin, Mao, and Castro, it also is likely to produce authoritarian and hierarchical societies as well as leadership cults. Similarly, theoretical objectivist materialism is likely to dry up in academic sterility. Though planning and state restructuring introduce decidedly public and political criteria into the mode of production, the representatives of capital and private accumulation retain the private right to decide what is to be produced in determinate quantities for which markets. Kirchheimer notes that the reinforcement and expansion of the role of the executive is secured at the expense of the legislature. Two implications of, the, of this development are clear. First, the undermining of the legislature is the first step towards the undermining of the popular bases of the state and the transition towards more and less authoritarian state forms such as fascism and corporatism. This is a development that marks the transition from a juridical epistemology in which the claims of reason and practice of law mutually complement one another to an authoritarian populist epistemology in which law sheds its rational character and assumes the character of something which is more like a command or a decree than a rational law. Second, the introduction of large-scale planning under the auspices of private ownership of the means of production and exchange blurs the distinction between private-slash- civil society and public-slash-state 
to such an extent that one can reasonably speak of a totalitarian, or as Obdorna put it, totally administered society. Kirchheimer's analysis foreshadows Hannah Arendt's 1906... Who, she, <laughs> Kirchheimer's analysis foreshadows Hannah Arendt's notion that totalitarianism was marked by the rise of a social administrative and, administrative and instrumental reason to the detriment of political judgment and political action. For her, this is a consequence of the rise of ubiquitous sociality accompanying the demise of the public-slash-private distinction and the concomitant disappearance of the public sphere. It also anticipates the young Habermas' notion that the dismantling of the public-private distinction marks the end of the liberal democratic phase of capitalism. During the 1960s and 1970s, Habermas articulates the view that the colonization of communication in the life world of interacting citizens by technical criteria tends to supplant communicative reason directed to understanding and an interest in emancipation with instrumental reason directed towards competition and an interest in strategic advantage. In Legitimation Crisis, published in 1973, Habermas argues that systematic, excuse me, systemic erosion of the structures of the life world casts considerable doubt on the long-term prospects of capitalist states to generate the requ requisite degree of legitimacy necessary to secure social stability. Seen within this theoretical framework, excuse me, seen within this theoretical framework, the introduction of capitalist planning will either generate a consensus for the implementation of the large institutions necessary for consistent planning, i.e. some form of socialist planning, or it will perpetuate the highly unstable combination of state intervention and private prerogative, which produces and reproduces the periodic legitimacy deficits in modern industrial societies. The neoliberal offensive of the 1980s and 1990s indicates that the latter possibility has prevailed to date, thus making the presentation of a socio-economic and political alternative to capitalism one of, the contemporary of, excuse me, one of the contemporary left's main theoretical and practical priorities. The question of legitimacy is at the center of the political ideas of Kirchheimer, Neumann, and Habermas. In remarks on Carl Schmitt's legality and legitimacy, Kirchheimer reminds readers that although one is apt to say, quote, liberal democracy, end quote, when speaking about the governments of advanced capitalist societies, the term itself connotes a potentially volatile combination of ideas about legality, quote, liberal, and legitimacy, quote, democracy. Commenting on the legal theory of Carl Schmitt, who lived from 1885 to 1985, and his book Legality and Legitimacy of 1932, Kirchheimer observes that despite his national socialist affiliations in the 1930s, Schmitt's work draws attention to one of the most basic contradictions in liberal democratic states. Liberal democracy champions individual liberty, and the sanctity of contractually mediated private interests within a legal framework that is said to derive its legitimacy from collective liberty based on a non-contractual foundation, popular sovereignty. Individuals are free to enter into and terminate contractual agreements when buying and selling labor power and other commodities, but individuals cannot sell their political rights of citizenship. The latter are non-negotiable attributes that are said to belong to the sovereign people in the manner of a pre-contractual, non-alienable, and unitary source. On this account, the legitimacy of the legal state resides in its ability to restore the original unity which is fragmented and strained as a result of the process of economic competition and class conflict. In liberal democratic theory, socioeconomic inequality and stratification in civil society is overridden by a more fundamental unity and political quality, equality in the state. Kirchheimer shows that the plausibility of this argument is undermined as soon as the bases of suffrage are widened without a corresponding reform of property rights, 
and the relations of production, he points out that the evolution of European states in the period from 1848 to the National Socialist assault on the Weimar Republic in 1933 is characterized by increasing political enfranchisement, though without a decisive transition to social ownership. The result is that political equality becomes a lever to pursue social equality, which runs up against the structural limit imposed by private ownership of the means of production. Each country is then faced with the choice of either socializing private socioeconomic rights in order to secure democratic legitimacy, or of enforcing liberal legality by protecting the rights of property and capital from egalitarian political infringement. Kirchheimer convincingly shows that any state that opts to consolidate the prerogatives of poverty and capital cannot indefinitely withstand democratic pressures for change without curtailing or eventually even abolishing democratic rights of citizenship. This is precisely what occurs in fascism, where trade unions are forcibly integrated into the state and opposition parties are repressed as, or banned outright. The, the hypothesis that a transition from a rational juridical epistemology to an authoritarian populist epistemology corresponds to the structural transformation of legal reason into authoritarian decree also informs the work of Franz Neumann. Like Kirchheimer's changes in the structure of political compromise, Neumann's Change in the Function of Law in Modern Society, published in the Journal for Social Research in 1937, is a key text of critical theory. Exploring the modalities of political transformation in relation to changes in the capitalist economy and society, whilst adopting a broadly Marxist framework of analysis, neither thinker really relies on a base superstructure model of explanation. Changes in legal argument and practice are not analyzed as mere reflections of economic centralization and monopoly formation. Without explicitly referring to Hegel in any detail, both authors retain the Hegelian idea that there can be no valid contract, and hence no modern forms of economic exchange without a sovereign state that validates contract in the first place. Hence, law and the state are neither conceived of as byproducts of economic change as in schematic Marxism, nor posited as autonomous from the economy as in much liberal democratic theory and structural and functionalist analyses. In the foreword to a collection of Neumann's most important essays, Marcuse remarks that Neumann seeks to develop an overarching theory of politics and a political theory of freedom combining history, sociology, political economy, and legal theory. In attempting to formulate an explicitly political theory of freedom, Neumann knows that there is no easy way back to Machiavellian or other versions of republicanism in light of the questions raised by Marx and Weber. In this context, one must bear in mind that just as Marxism is not meant to be a dogma or pseudoscience, Weber's ideas are not synonymous with the inevitability of rationalization, the disenchantment of the world, and the end of politics. Marx and Weber forced the student of politics to interrogate the conditions under which Republican citizenship could flourish in the modern world of advanced industry, and this, Neumann suggests, is not possible without a radical reorganization of the economy and property relations. One cannot simply exhort the citizenry to virtuous political participation as if one were still in the Greek polis or Renaissance city-state. Marx indicates that to all intents and purposes, the modern state is a vehicle for enforcing contracts and collecting taxes. This means that key political questions become the possible ways of financing state operations rather than giving expression to the general will, as in Rousseau, while, expecting, excuse me, while respecting the autonomy of individual citizens, Kant. For Neumann, it is not Machiavelli, Kant, Rousseau, and Hegel is not that Machiavelli, Kant, Rousseau, and Hegel have become irrelevant. The point is rather that it is reactionary to simply invoke a hollowed canon, excuse me, a haloed canon of thinkers without acknowledging the cesura with political tradition represented by Marx. To do this is symptomatic of the conservative tendency to bemoan the degradation of individual experience without addressing the economic base of this degradation.
Marx is the first to furnish a systematic account of the periodic structural transformations in state, society, and economy accompanying modernization understood in terms of increasing industrialization, secularization, and urbanization. Weber rounds out the picture by showing what becomes of the notion of reason in the wake of these developments. In the change in the function of law in modern society, Neumann suggests that the idea that the law is an example of the expression of the rational will of the citizenry rather than arbitrary whim or force is bound up with a particular account of the origins and sources of the authority of the law. It is his contention that the sources of the authority of the law change over time in conjunction with changes in church-slash-state and state-slash-civil society relations. He adds that the specificity of national context must be borne in mind when considering these changes. In England, for example, in contrast to Germany, the bourgeoisie relies on Parliament to a great degree to express its will in its dealings with the Crown and other sectors of English society. This meant that the transition from feudalism to more modern social and political arrangements in England was decidedly smoother than in Germany where the bourgeoisie was more likely to deal with the army and landed aristocracy in extra-parliamentary alliances. The precariousness of the German situation attained unparalleled clarity during the Weimar Republic. The extra-parliamentary power of the workers in the factories and their demands for socialized property came into conflict with the extra-parliamentary demands of the industrialists and their demands that the state guarantee propitious conditions for growth and accumulation. This turned out to be an irresolvable problem within the framework of the German version of the liberal democratic state form, especially since the Weimar Constitution made considerable concessions to working class interests concerning equality and rights of industrial consultation, and at the same time made concessions to capitalist interests concerning industrial discipline and securing the institutional conditions for the generation of private profit. For Neumann, one of the important lessons of that period in German history is that if democracy in practice is to be a form of state with real rather than merely symbolic content, it must be borne in mind that democracy presupposes a significant degree of social harmony and minimal levels of conflict between social classes. Democracy will not automatically produce harmony, and indeed democratic states will be structurally barred from doing so if their economies are continually reorganized according to the antagonistic premises inherent in the capitalist conception of contract and unquestioned disposal over labor power. This means that the relation between democracy and freedom is fundamentally misconstrued by liberals who believe that the role of the state is to create a legal framework regulating the competitive pursuit of ec private economic and personal interests. For Neumann, freedom and democracy are terms referring to the right of citizens to make collective democracy, excuse me, to make collective decisions and participate in public life as equals. That equality is undermined in freedom and democracy along with it when one tries to counter the expansion of franchise by restructuring economic processes so that capital is reallocating the privilege to control the labor process on new bases. Seen in this light, the importance of the question of legitimacy comes into clear focus. On the one hand, legitimacy can be secured by the rationally discursive content of collective decisions made by an informed citizenry actively constructing its representative institutions. In this case, it is possible to talk about political freedom. On the other hand, legitimacy can be manipulated by charismatic leaders allied with powerful extra-parliamentary private interests seeking to transform the citizenry into a mobilized and frightened mass. In the latter case, one is observing passive obedience. The discursive content of political legitimacy is a central theme in The Structural Transformation of the Public Sphere, published in 1962 by Jürgen Habermas. In this early work, Habermas takes up and elaborates the conception of the public sphere according to, excuse me, public sphere evoked in Kant's essay, What is Enlightenment, 1784. In that work, Kant argues that the sphere of morally autonomous private individuals can be linked to the political community of public citizens 
through the, con through the mediation process actualized in public debate. He quips that although it is extremely difficult for an individual to transcend their state of ignorance by themselves, a critical public can successfully achieve this by openly exchanging views, provided that this happens in a public rather than in the workplace, in the public sphere rather than in the workplace or at home. This is because the latter are examples of context where hierarchy sees, serves as a means for maximizing, maximizing efficiency, and the individuals in question are clearly not equal. By contrast, among the members of an assembly of equals, reason and speech can potentially function as ends in themselves, projecting subjective discussion toward objective understanding with cognitive content. Kant maintains that violent civil disobedience is never justified, only public discussion can be used to mediate between what he understands to be the natural rights of private individuals and the positive laws of public authority. In this light, Kant's position would appear to founder on the reality of government power by enjoying the, enjoining the participants of public sphere debate to suffer in non-silence while the sovereign state carries on monopolizing legitimate authority. As a tentative response to this problem, he suggests that just as all maxims resulting from the deliberations of the critical public should strive to be in accordance with existing law, existing law should try to conform to the moral and ethical standards set by disinterested discussion, aiming at truth rather than power or interest. By stressing that this ought to be the case, he concedes that there is always likely to be a discrepancy between the claims of order and authority and the claims of discursive rationality and understanding. In one sense, this discrepancy is regrettable in that this discrepancy implies that the law may never fully transcend authoritarian paternalism. In another sense, however, it is necessary. Anticipating Adorno's concept of coerced re reconciliation, Kant initiates, excuse me, intimates that the declared fusion of ethics and politics would dissolve the ethical as vantage point from which political reality can be criticized. Kant's hope is that if the claims of the public are redeemed in open discussion, and if they acquire a universal validity as a result of the forms of agreement that ensue in the course of this process, then the maximum formulated Excuse me, then the maxims formulated by the public acquire a discursive truth content which legitimate lawmakers simply cannot ignore. The structural transformation of the excuse me, in the structural transformation of the public sphere, Habermas analyzes the Kantian model of the public sphere as a possible source of norms for legitimating political authority. Habermas indicates that the marked differences between democratic and undemocratic polities can be compared by ascertaining whether authority is legitimized in terms of reason and free discussion, according to the stated goals of the Enlightenment, or if authority is legitimated as a result of the more, rather more arbitrary play of powerful interest in search of strategic compromise, in keeping with the practice of despotisms throughout the ages. Habermas warns Habermas warns that the promise of enlightenment as democratic politics is threatened by the technological and administrative forces behind industrialization if the latter are allowed to fundamentally structure the conditions of political compromise and determine the parameters of collective decision making. Modern forms of economic organization tend to do precisely this in a series of processes to which he refers as the colonization of institutions like this public sphere by the systematic imperatives of economic growth. Excuse me, systemic imperatives of economic growth. This argument is re-articulated in Knowledge and Human Interests, published in 1968, Legitimation Crisis, published in 1973, and in considerably modified form in Between the Facts and the Norms, published in 1992. Whether he is theorizing about the public sphere, the life world, or civil society, Habermas emphasizes the idea that legitimate forms of democracy cannot be attained through strategic compromise alone. This is the traumatic lesson of Weimar that needs to be borne in mind, especially in periods of economic growth, when the economy seems to be able to legitimize the polity. Since it is really the other way around, the polity must legitimize the economy in a democratic state. 
The norms of efficient means, inequality, and hierarchical command have their place in a sphere of activity where people pursue technical interests. However, these interests cannot be allowed to colonize the norms of discursive ends equally and mutual understanding. Excuse me. However, these interests cannot be allowed to colonize the norms of discursive ends, equality and mutual understanding and recognition that people have in a sphere where people pursue communicative and emancipatory interests. Habermas is one of contemporary Europe's best-known living theorists, a man with an illustrious career who knew and worked with a number of first gen the first generation of Frankfurt School critical theorists. <laughs> there is no space here to evaluate his role as the key thinker of the second generation of critical theorists or to analyze his evolution from critical theory to communicative action marked by the two-volume theory of communicative action published in 1981. The aim of concluding this chapter with a brief word on some of his ideas about the public sphere and political legitimacy is to illustrate the immensity of issues taken up by the Frankfurt School from its earliest days in the 1920s to today. In addition to the rich patrimony of ideas bequeathed to present and coming generations of militants on the left, the Frankfurt School and critical theory remain highly instructive about the possibilities as well as the great difficulties of translating theory into revolutionary action. It has been seen that they argued interdisciplinary, excuse me, that they regard interdisciplinary research as a key component in the project to mediate theory and practice. Chapters 4 and 5 will show how this mediation has also been and continues to be conceived in more direct terms by other approaches to creative social transformation.